You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK Project. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. It's always a pleasure to be on with you, John. Now, David, one of the most exciting things that I can personally think of, because I know what the implications of it are, is the discovery of exomoon candidates. We're on number two now. Can you give us an overview of this new candidate for an exomoon and why why is it compelling? Yeah, we've been looking for exomoons for a long time, as you know, and they're hard to discover. They're transit signals, which is the primary way we're looking for them, is by them passing in front of their stars, get mixed up with that of the planet. So you have the planet, which of course has this huge signal, but then on top of that is this very small moon-like signal, which is kind of intermixed with it, makes it difficult to disentangle from the planet. So what we've been doing is we've been, over the last few years, we've been basically picking through all of the planets that we think are the best moon hunting grounds. And what we ended up agreeing upon within our team was that it was the cool giants that had the most promise for finding exomoons. So a cool giant is basically something which somewhat resembles Jupiter. It's on a long orbital period, at least longer than that of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. It is within half, uh, anywhere from half a Jupiter size up to twice Jupiter's radius. And its orbit also, we can tell, is consistent with that of a circular orbit, similar to that of Jupiter's orbit. So if we have those three things, we call it a you know, a Jupiter analog planet, a cool giant. And we've been surveying those as carefully as we can with existing data to see if we can find evidence for moons. And from that multi-year survey, it has been like three or four years, I think we've been working on this particular sample, emerged this new exomoon candidate, just one, Kepler-1708b-i. Now, this is an extraordinarily tiny signal amongst a, as you said, a big signal. So, but we have to sort of frame that. It's not a big signal. You know, when you detect an exoplanet, it's a tiny little dip that you can see in a light curve. But if you see irregularities in that dip, you might have an exomoon. Is that a good characterization of this? Yeah, it's a second dip, and that's not the only way you can detect an exomoon. The method we are primarily relying on, as I said, is these transits. But even within transits, there's multiple pieces of evidence that we can use to tell that there is a moon there. So the first one that was actually ever invented isn't to look at the transits of the moon at all. Instead, it's to look at the wobble of the planet as caused by the moon around it. So the moon has its own mass and therefore gravitational field. It tugs on the planet and we can detect those wobbles that it induces on the planet. At least usually we can do that. So that's one primary way we can do that. But in, for Kepler-1708b, that is not possible. And the reason is because the planet, by virtue of how we selected it, is a long period Jupiter so long that its orbital period is about two years and Kepler only looked at it for four years. So we actually, it turns out we only have two transits of this planet in front of the star and it's impossible to look for a wobble if you just have two events. I mean, you can always basically just say the time difference between them is the orbital period, but you can't infer any extra deviations in, in addition to that. So unfortunately, we, they're basically that TTV method, the transit timing variation method that has been a core method we've been using for years to look for moons is just not available to us here. And so, yeah, here we had to just rely on one piece of evidence, which was the 
transit of the moon in front of the star. Now that had to have been confounding, though. In in actually, when when you have that little of an amount of data in comparison to other candidates to work with, that had to have been a hard one to convince yourself that it was actually real, right? Yeah, I, th- I mean, we almost approach it the other way around, John. So we kind of approach it from the perspective that we're going to go through all these objects. We're going to see if anything formally crosses our detection criteria, which we set before we even get started. So, you know, before we've looked at any data, we sit down and agree, okay, what would be our threshold for calling something an exomoon? And it, it can't be, it just looks like a moon by eye. That's not enough because the human eye is, of course, not a particularly reliable instrument when it comes to any kind of scientific investigation. So we need some kind of clear statistical framework to which we're going to say this is a moon versus not a moon. So we devise that. And then this object amongst um, the 70 sample of 70 plants that we looked at ended up crossing all of our criteria. So we got to that point and, you know, we didn't that doesn't mean we believe it. We're still skeptical. So we look at this individual object and say, hey, maybe there is some way that it passes all of our criteria, but it's still not a moon. You know, there's something about this star that's misbehaving. I mean, I know fans of your channel will know a lot about Boyajian star. Tabby star, for instance, as an example of how stars can be very mischievous. They could really trick us in strange ways. And so, you know, this isn't quite a Boyajian star type situation, but still the star could be tricking us in some way. So we go through a battery of extra tests to try and tell this. So we, you know, check the, could the instrument, could the Kepler telescope that we used somehow be tricking us? So we look at the individual pixels, we detrend, correct the data with eight different algorithms and make sure they all agree. We look at the nearby stars, see if any of those could be interfering with our star in some way, just not directly, but just in terms of how the light enters the telescope. Um, And then we look at the star itself to see Could it be covered in star spots? Could those star spots be somehow tricking us to thinking there's a moon? And so we go on and on and on through all these different things. And I think the best way to describe this exomoon candidate, Kepler 1708b-i, is that we just can't kill it. No matter what we do, it passes every test we can think of. Now, that's not the same thing as saying this is a confirmed slam dunk you know, real exomoon. But there's nothing we can think of to prove otherwise at this point. Um, We would like to get more data and maybe that additional data might, you know, prove that it's not a moon or it might confirm the case. But with the data we have right now, we've pushed this as hard as we can. And the signal we see, the most likely astrophysical explanation for it is that it is an exomoon. Now let's talk about likelihoods. Now, I remember when I first got into astronomy in the late 1980s, we didn't even know that exoplanets existed, but it was strongly suspected because there was no reason that they don't. And I think the same thing applies to exomoons. They're probably numerous and pervade the entire universe. So we're at the very earliest point actually confirming one of these things. How far do you think we're from that? I mean, do you think you can confirm this new candidate? It's certainly possible we could confirm this with telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, if it continues to operate, or the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, of course, now just recently arrived into its orbital position at L2. Um, Both of those would have superior precision to that of Kepler, and thus we would expect them to be capable of confirming this moon. Of course, we're going to have to be patient because the orbital period of this planet is two years so it's actually not even going to transit in 2022 at all the next event that we will see an opportunity to catch it transiting will be march 2023 so we have to wait a while but we could in principle ask hubble or james webb if they would observe this target again and maybe we could catch that transit signal but even then it's not guaranteed because of course the moon is on an orbit around the planet and so in order for us to get a clean detection of the exomoon, we kind of require the moon and the planet to be as widely separated as possible as seen from our perspective. But of course, sometimes the moon will actually be almost on top of the planet. And the the more on top of the planet it is, the harder it is for us to distinguish its signal. So you also need really not just one transit, you want to kind of catch this a couple of times to really have that chance of confirming or denying the signal. So 
look, it's going to be years. I know that's frustrating, but if you're looking at Jupiter analog planets, that's kind of par for the course. You're going to have to be patient. It's not the only approach, though. We could also look for other uh, exomoons around other similar types of planets. Um, I think a startling aspect of this discovery, and one that's maybe interesting to discuss, is the properties of the moon itself. I mean, this is a mini Neptune-sized moon, and there's clearly nothing like that in the solar system. And so it's very hard to um, to judge the reality of it, given that there's no precedence for it, at least that we know of in the solar system. Um, Exoplanets has, has, of course, had to wrangle with this itself historically through the detection of hot Jupiters, for instance. So at the moment, it's very difficult to assess how genuine this signal is without more data. But rather than just going after this one target, I think if we found a whole population of supersized moons out there, once we get, say, 10 of them, then maybe we would look back at this first detection and or first couple of detections and say, actually, maybe they weren't so strange after all. You know, actually, we can see the larger picture now that even though they appeared perhaps unbelievable when we first saw them, we can now tell that they are indeed part of this broader population. Now, before we get to the size of this moon, which I definitely want to ask you about, because this is, again, as you say, there is no analog of this in, in the solar system. But there's also no reason why it couldn't exist. But before we get to that, now, the James Webb Space Telescope, you mentioned that just today, actually, it arrived at L2 successfully, which it has been nothing but magnificent success so far in deploying itself. Now, a cold Jupiter, does it make observations, say you, you were able to get time on James Webb, does that make it easier on you, you know, instead of a, a warm Jupiter, a cold Jupiter? Does that, with an infrared telescope like this, does that make it easier to maybe detect the exomoon? To be honest, not really, no. It's probably harder. <laughs> so there's a few, I mean, we don't really detect the infrared heat coming off the planet itself, at least not using the transit method. There are proposed ideas for looking for exomoons that would exploit that capability of James Webb. So for instance, you think of Io around Jupiter, it's being tidally heated. And so if you were to take an infrared image of the pair of them, you would see this kind of hot spot that shifted over even outside the disk of the planet that would tell you, okay, there's, there's some satellite around this thing, which is being thermally heated, it's probably tidal heating. Now, the transit method is quite different. We don't try to detect the heat or the warmth, or even the light off the planet itself. Instead, we're actually detecting the shadows, the absence of light, as the planet passes in front of the star. Now, the reason why it's basically impossible to look at the light of the planet itself is because stars are about a billion times brighter than planets. So there's just no way to compete. When the planet's passing in front of the star, you know, don't even attempt to try and look at the light of the planet. You're just being completely glared out from the from the star itself. So instead, we're looking at that decrease in light caused by the planet passing in front of the star and indeed its moons. And here, you know, think about a long period or cool planet. What are the differences? Well, the difference would be that it's a much longer orbital period. So as I said, the first problem with that is patience. You know, I, ideally, the planet you'd be looking at would transit every day. So that'd be a one-day orbital period for that planet. If that happened, then, you know, you could observe it every day for a week. And in just one week's observations, you'd have seven transits, seven instances of the moon transiting. You'd have a very short detection. Of course, the problem with that is that one-day period planets are so close to their star, they're not very likely to have moons. And indeed, some efforts have been made to look for them, and they really do appear quite devoid of satellite systems. That's not particularly surprising. So... Not only do we have to be patient, but the other aspect of these plants is that they move slowly. And if you think about sort of throwing a penny down kind of one of those charity wells as it kind of spins down, it speeds up as it gets closer and closer towards the center. And the same thing is true for planetary orbits. They, their speed gets faster when they're closer to the star. And so as a result of that, the duration of the transits is much, much shorter when the planet's close and much, much longer when the planet's far away. So long, in fact, that for these planets, it often takes them 24 hours, a whole day, to pass over their star. So that means that you have to ask the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope for much more data than you would otherwise. So that means that if I ask Hubble or James Webb to look for an exomoon, I have to probably ask for something like two whole days of data. And I'm competing with other astronomers who want to use the telescope, 
Uh, maybe they want to observe the atmosphere of a hot Jupiter planet, and they only require two hours of data because the transit duration is so short, that's all they need in order to catch the full transit. So I'm asking for a lot more data, and I don't even know really there's an exomoon there. So it is inherently a high-risk proposal. And so I think, you know, these aspects of these long period planets make them a challenging case for telescopes to give us the time we need. But the counterpoint to this, just to give you guys some excitement, some optimism, because I'm certainly optimistic for James Webb, is that James Webb can detect, we believe, from some calculations in my team we've been doing, that it could detect moons as small as the moons around Jupiter. So think about Europa, um, Ganymede, especially the largest moon, those would be detectable even with a single transit for some of the best targets we have. We think that just a single transit from James Webb could detect true analogs, not exotic supermoons, but things we know exist, things that would not be controversial to discover. Um, so I'm very excited about the future prospects of them, but we do have to keep in mind it's going to be everyone's favorite telescope for the next 10, 20 years. And so we're going to be having to pitch our case convincingly that why this is the best science it needs to do. And I have to say, I can't say enough about my excitement for James Webb. Just just watching it finally get up there and then just perform flawlessly as it deploys. has just been absolutely amazing. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Okay. So you could probably detect IO under certain circumstances as a hot, you know, moon. Could it be that an alien civilization out there relatively close that has a telescope 10 times the size of James Webb floating in space could detect IO from a distance above the other moons of, of Jupiter, the Galilean moon. So is, is Io the easy one to detect for in such a situation? That's a good question. I think we'd have to run the numbers, to be honest with you with that, to, to give you a clear definitive answer. Um, there has been some studies, in particular, a colleague of mine called Vera Dobos um, in Hungary has been estimating the, the detectability of Io analogs. Um, but really, they had in mind kind of super IO. So even though IO has you know quite a bit of volcanism on its surface, I think it's not enough for something like James Webb to have a chance of detecting. And so the moons that they imagined, at least in the study that I read, was a kind of scaled up, more extreme version of that. So you can imagine kind of increasing the tidal heating by a factor of 10, making the moon maybe Earth size rather than kind of more diminutive size that Io has. And in that case, I think, yeah, it's actually feasible that we could detect the infrared signature of such a small moon. Um, in terms of what you could do with a super James Webb, well, I'm not sure I've, yeah, I'm not sure I've seen any calculations of that just because I think for the moment, astronomers kind of all ratcheting around what James Webb can do and thinking about its capabilities. But certainly, obviously, the more uh, aperture you have, the larger your telescope, the smaller uh, a signal you could possibly detect. And so I, I, I don't see any reason why Io would not be detectable with a sufficiently large infrared telescope. And that's pretty amazing if you think about it, because we often talk about habitability and we look for Earth-like worlds and eventually Earth-like moons. And the reality is that we could detect a wildly volcanic <laughs> moon like Io at a distance, and that in and of itself is really interesting. But you could infer it too, because we know from its orbit, Io is being flexed by Jupiter's gravity and going around inside of a giant radiation torus. But we could infer these things about even moons that we don't even get to habitability, right? Yeah. And, you know, this This also is true for planets as well. So you can make the same argument for a tidally heated planet. The planet could be on a slightly eccentric orbit around its star, and thus it would be receiving significant tidal heating. And we even know of some planets that might fit the bill for that. One of the most interesting types of planets, I think, that if you're interested in sort of the sci-fi idea of like a Mustafa, since we're talking about tidal heating and these kind of lava worlds, there are some rocky super earths and even earth sized planets which are on extremely close orbits around their star so much so that the surface just from stellar radiation would be liquid it'd be be looking at a lava surface across the entire planet and even a lot of that lava would vaporize to form an atmosphere 
And so what's really exciting is that James Webb is an excellent machine for detecting the atmospheres of alien planets through, again, this transit method. It can kind of just tell, does the planet look smaller or bigger at different infrared colors? And that can tell you about the absorption features of the gases in the atmosphere. And so you can actually tell, you could get the atmospheric spectra of gases which would essentially be vaporized lava and thus you would be able to infer the composition of the bulk of that planet from remote observations. There's basically no other way of doing that. It's, it's a really kind of incredible idea that James Webb could actually tell what other planets are made of through a direct detection, not inference, not guesswork. It would actually be able to measure it. Which again, that, that gives you... An, uh, so I'm sort of fixated on this because we look at things like Jupiter's moons and most of them are icy, but Io is not. And Io has this weird history of just being too close to Jupiter. And it, it presents itself very different from the other Galilean moons. And the idea that we could see this in other star systems, you know, allows for a kind of a characterization of, of a planet that, or a moon that we only really have one example of, you know, there's only one Io and that maybe these could be common, which is really interesting because it's, it's not really, it's a different situation than most of our solar system presents. Yeah, and, and tidal heating, of course, is so important in that system because almost by studying Io, you get to learn about the tidal processes, which are presumably therefore occurring at the next moon along in that chain, which is, of course, Europa. And Europa is a incredibly interesting place from an astrobiological perspective. It could have, and almost certainly does have, in fact, a liquid ocean underneath its surface, and that's got many of us excited about the prospects of there being potentially life there. And the reason why we're able to learn so much about how tides are affecting Europa is, of course, by studying Io, and you can measure the tidal dissipation rates very precisely from that object and then kind of use it as a proxy to understand Europa. So you're right, there really is only one case that's quite as extreme as Io. And I suspect there's far more extreme versions out there in the universe because let's face it, the universe has a far greater imagination than just what we see in our own backyard. And, you know, Io is such a fascinating work. There's even other ways you could detect that such a strange system. I mean, one of the curiosities, again, of this thing is that it spits out so much volcanism that there are, it kind of forms these plumes of material, which, because of the weak gravity, are able to escape into space. And so a lot of that material ends up getting charged through solar radiation, becomes ionized, and then gets trapped in the magnetic field lines and accelerates along Jupiter's magnetic field lines. And when that happens, they produce synchrotron radiation. And so it's possible that you could actually detect radio emissions from a Jupiter with moons by virtue of this process. And so that's actually been suggested as well as one of the ways we could look for these kind of exotic um, outgassing moons, which presumably happens as a result of this type of process, um, would be through looking in the radio. So we have infrared telescopes, we have optical telescopes looking for transits. Now we also have radio and all of these methods can come to bear and teach us something about these moons. That's absolutely fascinating. Now let's get a little bit wild with it. This is a, this new detection candidate is huge, mini Neptune. And this constrains, you know, this op actually unconstrains the, <laughs> the size of moons that, that can, that can occur. What, at what point, and this might get a little too much into nomenclature, but people are going to ask, at what point does it become a double planet? Yeah, I knew you'd ask me that. It's the question I actually, yeah, kind of avoid answering most of the time. Um, so, yeah, my, you know, you probably uh, remember my student, Alex Teacher, who discovered the first exomoon that worked with me, and he had much stronger... Uh, views and we discuss this very often about you know nomenclature and things and how you name these things and I kind of sit on it the same in a similar way to how I think about Pluto I, I don't really care that much about the nomenclature I think to give you some overview of how, maybe how others think even though I, I'm fairly apathetic to it um, and I just say the reason why I feel that way is just because you know a rose by any of the rose a rose by any of the name still smells as sweet it really doesn't matter what you call it it's still a wonderful thing and this obsession we have for taxonomy is in many ways a human construct but i'll leave that aside and just say that you know in terms of how you might define a binary planet um 
there's there's different ideas. One idea is that you could take, for instance, the center of mass between the two objects, and you could say, well, if the center of mass lives inside the planet, then you would call that a planet-moon system. And that would be true of the Earth-Moon system, for instance. The center of mass is about a thousand kilometers or so beneath the Earth's surface when the Moon's directly at zenith. Um, or you could uh, imagine as the Moon got more massive, it would pull the center of mass further out. And eventually, once the center of mass sort of lives in between them, which is what happens for Pluto and its Moon, Charon, then you have a binary planet situation. I mean, one criticism I have of that would be that the moon's position is constantly changing. It's actually migrating out. So it moves at four centimeters per year, about an inch per year away from us, just due to tides that it raises on the Earth. And so eventually that center of mass would actually leave the Earth's surface and move out into space. And so kind of overnight, we'd have to suddenly redefine ourselves um, and nothing would have changed, you know, it would, there'd be no dramatic explosions or anything in, on the planet like this. It just the very slight movement of the moon further away from us would suddenly change us from a planet moon system to a binary planet system. And, you know, that's, to me, that's somewhat unsatisfying. Maybe to others, that's OK. Um, so I think this, you know, drawing this line in the sand, it's always somewhat ad hoc. Um, and I, I don't know that there's any agreed upon definition about when a think when an object becomes a true binary planet there's no there's certainly no iau definition for that criteria um and it's not something that the astronomy community has frankly discussed in too much detail i think had pluto retained its planethood it might have eventually been raised as an issue for a definition because of the pluto sharon configuration um, but since pluto was demoted it kind of shelved that discussion to some degree but I, I want to hear what you think, Joe. Do you think, it, you know, what, what would you call a binary planet? Pluto is a planet forever uh, for the completely arbitrary reason that I want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a healthy respect for Pluto being 46 years old. And well, David, Pluto is a planet forever, in my view, and it cannot be demoted because of just entirely human arbitrary reasons of having thought of it as a planet for most of my life. Now, the thing is, is that what happens if we get a signal, a SETI signal, that after much work and um, study, it appears to be coming from an exomoon, and that possibly because you might have more chances for exomoons than you do proper habitable zone planets, that if we ever detect an alien civilization, it could be native to an exomoon. And that changes it because you don't really want to demote an alien civilization and say, <laughs> well, they don't have a planet, they just have a moon. So <laughs> how does yeah, that, that affect that the might nomenclature? one day have an effect. It's hard to speculate about all the um, social reactions that I'm sure we would have to that, you know, historic moment if it ever transpires in our lifetime. But it would certainly change things. I mean, Look, exomoons, uh, you know this, they have so much importance when it comes to the question of life. I think sometimes people get, consider exomoons to be this kind of niche aspect of the of this broader problem of, you know, exoplanetology. Like, why why is this particularly important? And I think it really is, is central to so many of the questions that exoplanets really care about, including, I think, life especially. So I'll give you a few different examples as just to why I think this is so important in this, you know, to carry on this vein of thinking about life in the universe. You know, one, as you just point out, they could be living on a habitable moon. That's the most obvious one. That's the one that sci-fi plays with. If you've seen any, you know, like Avatar or Star Wars, whatever, the, you know, this is a very common trope in sci-fi to have people living on exomoons. And there's, as far as we can tell, there's no reason why that isn't perfectly plausible. If you, if you have moons like the moons we find in our own backyard, and you have these super moons, then surely there's something in between Earth-sized moons, which are out there as well. So that's actually one reason why these super moons are so important. They're kind of potentially telling us that there must be some continuum of moon sizes in the universe. Moreover, though, they actually are thought to have a big influence on the planet which they orbit. So I'm sure there's some rare Earth fans out there as well. I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a rare Earth advocate. I think it's a really interesting idea. But in that theory, 
it is suggested that the Earth's moon plays a central role in the Earth being habitable. It kind of stabilizes our obliquity. It raises, of course, the large tides that we have on the Earth. And it's probably very important for our past. It, you know, the giant impact may have stripped off a huge amount of that thick lithosphere that once covered the Earth and eventually formed the moon. And perhaps if that had never have happened, the crust would be much thicker and it would form this kind of stagnant lid where plate tectonics can never occur. So some speculation there for sure, but interesting ideas nonetheless about why if you find an Earth twin, one of the first questions you will probably ask is, does it have a moon twin? And then finally, even if you don't buy th that argument at all, which certainly many of my colleagues don't, and I'm sort of s indeed skeptical about to some degree myself, there's a very practical reason to look for exomoons and to, to want to study them. And that's that, look, if, if you really believe that planets are the be-all and end-all when it comes to life in the universe, you still have to care a lot about moons because one day, maybe James Webb, but most likely it'll be a direct imaging telescope like Louvoir or HabEx that we're currently proposing for the next generation. These telescopes will try to take a photo of another planet, a pale blue dot from many light years away. And when they look at that pale blue dot, those telescopes have sufficient resolution to be able to tell the difference between the planet and the star. But that's that you were talking about building, you know, 10 to 20 meter class telescopes in space that have the resolution to, to pull apart at the orbital separation of the planet and the star. But they certainly don't have enough resolution to resolve the planet, not even a moon's orbit around that planet. So if that planet, if that pale blue dot had a moon, well, it would just be mixed up. And so really you'd have a bluey gray dot in the case of the Earth-Moon system. The moon's, the moon's color would be intermixed with that pale blue dot. There'd be no way to resolve it. And so when you looked at the spectrum of light, the rainbow of light coming off that pale blue dot, you would see different evidence for molecules, perhaps some even atmospheric molecules. If you imagine the Earth's moon was Titan, for instance, instead, well, now you've got methane, which is a biotic gas on Earth. I mean, methane is thought to be a biotic gas. And you have a completely different chemistry for your, let's say the Earth was a barren rock instead, maybe more like Mars. In that case, you would see this chemical disequilibrium in your spectrum, and that is the hallmark of life. So many of these future telescopes we're going after, their whole intent is to look for chemical disequilibria, which is what life does in a very general sense. It creates chemical disequilibria. But if you don't know there's a moon there, you're going to think there's a chemical disequilibria when there is none. So whether you like it or even if you don't like moons, as you don't believe they could be habitable and you don't believe they have any impact on planets' habitability, you still can't get around their importance because they're going to mess up all of your data when it comes to trying to look at these plants for life. Okay, now that complicates it. And at the risk of getting a bunch of comments thrown at me about internet memes, the idea of moon moons and this you know concept where you could have perhaps a large moon of a planet, but it has something orbiting it. Do you think this is something that probably happens in the universe or do you think it's just too complicated and probably doesn't well certainly you can put clearly you can put stable satellites around moons because we've done it we've orbited the moon <laughs> with the apollo spacecraft and other lunar reconnaissance images and things and clearly it's it's dynamically possible there's no doubt about that it's dynamically possible to maintain stable orbits the real question is um can you maintain that orbit for a very long period of time is it a stable orbit for millions, billions of years? And then the second question is, can you even naturally form something there in the first place? Now, the first question in terms of long-term stability, after our exomoon candidate from before came out, Kepler-1625, which was also a big moon, in fact, even bigger. It's a Neptune-sized moon in that case. Indeed, there were several papers that started to speculate about the idea of Submoons or moon moons. There was some uh, kind of war of the words going on as to what we should call these things for a while, but I think we've kind of settled on moon moon. It's just for the pure comedy of it. So we have these moon moons objects, and it was found that indeed, from a dynamical perspective, they should be long term stable. There's no reason why you couldn't have such a thing. But as far as I'm aware, no one has really addressed what I think is the more challenging question of how do you form something like that? Would you expect that to happen 
frequently in the universe or would that be an incredibly contrived situation? Um, certainly all the mechanisms we think about with how moons form don't trivially translate to moon moons. And so we don't really have a good handle as to that question. And we don't have examples either, um, <laughs> uh, as far as we know. You no. know. Now, with a planet, a really big planet like, like the new candidate would be if it's there, a really big planet like that, you have another tidal force going on. Instead of like the Earth-Moon system, you have a giant gas planet right next to you. And we see with Io that that can heat and flex and do things. So has anybody put any work into thinking about whether a habitable moon around a gas giant even needs a moon to sort of tap into the rare Earth hypothesis thing? Do you even need it? Because if you've got tides being created by a giant planet next to you, then that would eliminate at least one of the arguments for rare Earth, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there are certainly some advantages from a habitability perspective that we could at least imagine might be true for moons around gas giants. And um, you're right that one of them may be that if you do require your obliquity to be stabilized through tidal mechanisms, you certainly have no shortage of that by orbiting a gas giant planet. Um, you're also going to, of course, get plenty of tides. I mean, the reason why tides are thought to be important is because in the, on the early Earth, the moon was much closer. And so when that was true, the moon would have raised much larger tides, so much so that it would have covered entire continents. And so you would have had essentially rock pools forming across the entire continent, which would therefore be potential seats for where biology may have started. So this is sort of one of the, again, more speculative ideas about why having tides could have been beneficial. Um, you know, for the, for the moon, though, it's kind of now lost a lot of that. It doesn't have tidal heating. And so you, a question you might ask is, why does Io have tidal heating, but the moon well, has almost none. There's a very, very tiny amount, but hardly any. And the real reason is because of it's not just Io's orbit and even the nature of Jupiter. It's the entire dynamical environment within which Io sits. And Io only really has tidal heating because of the other moons in that system. If Io was left to its own devices, it would eventually, um, fairly quickly, find itself in a circular orbit around Jupiter. When you have tidal forces, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to circularize the orbit into a nice symmetrical shape. Now, the problem is that Io can't get into a circular orbit. It's trying to, but every time it tries to, the interactions with the other moons in the system, which are resonant with it, kind of t distort the shape of the orbit back into an ellipse. And so whenever you have an elliptical orbit, the moon finds itself sometimes closer to the planet at perijove and sometimes further away at apogeove and therefore the gravitational field that it's experiencing is changing dramatically between those two positions and that's deforming io physically kind of like squishing a squash ball in your hand you're changing its shape over and over again and so that's the source of the tidal heating so in terms of thinking about you know to come back to the original question what would it be like if you're a moon around this planet even that isn't enough I think, to really unlock the full nature of what life would be like on such a moon. You'd have to also ask, are there other moons? Are they maintaining an eccentric orbit? Um, what, are they in resonances with each other? And only when you have all of those details could you truly assess the potential habitability. And so moons have incredibly complicated, multidimensional aspects to their habitability calculations. Um, one that has been actually a lot of fun for myself and many of my colleagues to have uh, done work on in the past. Now, I have to ask a question. So, other paths towards habitability in life. Now, we know that Io is spewing out sulfur compounds and everything from its volcanoes, and these land on Europa. You know, there's actually a, a mark on Europa that, that is formed by Io, you know, releasing material. So could it be possible that there's a situation where the nutrients for life are deposited on an exomoon from another exomoon in a nearby orbit that creates the conditions for life where you wouldn't normally think they would be? 
Yeah, that's a great idea. I have to say I hadn't thought of that before, but I mean, certainly you have the example, as you say, of Aya in Europa, and there's a lot of material that's swirling around the circum-Jupiter environment that is interchanging as a result of these tidal forces, but also the weak surface gravity. I mean, I think if you, a key point there is that if you made Io Earth mass, then its gravitational field would be much stronger. And so those plumes, they'd still ride, you know, maybe a kilometer or two into the sky, but I doubt they'd be able to get as high. And so they might not be able to reach that kind of escape velocity needed to eventually land on Europa. So again, it goes to show you just there's many dimensions to this. And certainly if all of the moons were similar mass, so Io was low mass, you'd kind of reason that the other moons should be low mass as well, is if you believe they form from a circumplanetary disk. There's no reason why you'd have enormous differences between their masses. Um, certainly the four Galilean moons all formed from the disk and material around Jupiter, we think, and have fairly comparable masses to one another. And so if the material that's escaping Io lands on your nearby moon, but all of them are, lo are, are very low surface gravity, they might not be able to sustain a stable atmosphere on around them as a result of their low surface gravity. So that's another uh, aspect of this problem. And so, yeah, it's, it's fun to think about all the different dimensions that these moons have. I mean, another fun one is the magnetic field, right? So these, another interesting case with Io and the inner moons is that, you know, you might say they can't be habitable even if you scale them up because they, they don't have their own magnetic field. Um, and they're very close to Jupiter, which is also a problem. Certainly, Io is so close to Jupiter that it's being bombarded by radiation from essentially the equivalent of what we call the Van Allen belts on the Earth that are happening on Jupiter that would essentially sterilize the surface. If an astronaut ever went to Io, they'd need a lot of radiation protection to survive that environment. And to some degree, it's true for Europa as well. It's certainly more than Earth level um, radiation on Europa's surface. But if you get slightly further out, you get to sort of Callisto and Ganymede, the, the levels are comparable to Earth radiation or even lower in Ganymede's case. And then once you're out to that kind of distance, you actually also have the benefit of spending some time, not all the time, but some time within Jupiter's magnetopause. So Jupiter has this magnetic field around it that's, um, you know, all things being equal to be kind of quasi-spherical in shape, but the solar wind pushes against it and kind of forms this kind of comet, comet tail kind of shape around the, around the planet. And so the moons are orbiting in and out of that of that magnetopause, as we call it. And whenever they're inside it, they're actually protected from solar radiation. And they spend some fraction of the time where they're outside it, but it's about half-half. And so even though the moons don't have their own magnetic field, it's actually thought that they spend long enough inside the magnetopause that it could be sufficient to protect them and allow for habitable conditions were they to be scaled up a bit. So again, another like really fun example of how these environments are so exotic so alien really to anything that we are familiar with at least for the earth moon system and raise all sorts of interesting prospects and ideas for sci-fi writers such as yourself john of thinking about what would life be like how would things evolve on these planets because the conditions have all of these other criterion dimensions occurring and we have to take a break i'm joined today by dr david kipping host of the cool world's youtube channel and if you like this channel you're gonna like david's so We'll be back in a moment. Will we, John? Another hour? Aren't you overworking poor Ross? When is the last time you even checked in on him? What? He's fine. I gave him water yesterday. Well, actually, that might have been Monday. Opening a channel to Ross. 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 Ross! Are you there? How are you? What? Is that the voice of God? Where am I? What year is it? Well, that seals it. Expect part two next week. I am working. <laughs> 